Civil rights leader Fannie Lou Hamer is often remembered for this famous speech at the 1964 Democratic National Convention. Is this America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, where we have to sleep with our telephones off of the hook because our lives be threatened daily because we want to live as decent human beings in America? Hammer used that moment to call for delegates from her Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party to be seated at the convention rather than the state's all-white Democratic Party delegation. And although that effort proved unsuccessful, she brought greater national attention to the oppression of black Americans in the South. That DNC speech was one of Hamer's best-known public moments in a life that spanned from a hard-scrabble childhood in the Mississippi Delta to a midlife ascension as a well-known activist and leader to an untimely death at age 59 from breast cancer in an all-black hospital. A new documentary coming next week to PBS and the World Channel called Fannie Lou Hamer's America tells the full story of Hamer's life through speeches, interviews, and song. It's co-produced by Hamer's great niece, investigative reporter Monica Land. She joins me now along with the film's director and editor, Joy Davenport. Thank you both for being here. Monica, let me start with you. In the documentary, your great aunt says that she was, if I have my math right, about 45 years old, when she discovered that black Americans could actually register to vote and vote. What changed in her life and in the culture at large when she had that epiphany or paved the way for that epiphany? Um, I, I think it was just circumstance. And Joy can definitely speak to that better than I can. Okay. Um, but growing up as a sharecropper, her life was definitely oppressive. And I think anyone in that situation would obviously want to do better. And so um, she tells the story that she heard there was a mass meeting um, at a local church, William Chapel. Um, she asked my uncle, could she attend? Um, there was some kind of bargain. If she picked so much cotton or something or another, uh, that he would take her. She did exactly that and she attended. And so it was revelational that she could have a voice in how she was living her life. And from that moment on, she chose to do exactly that, um, not only for herself, but for every other black person in Mississippi. Um, I think and eventually the nation, but particularly Mississippi where they were so oppressed, where there was so much poverty um, and disadvantage. And so wanting to make that known um, throughout the state. And I think the film does drive home, both with older footage, there's a lot of fascinating, um, very evocative and at times tough to watch older footage and newer footage, which is also depressing because it suggests not a ton of progress has been made that drives home the reality of that material impoverishment that you're talking about, which obviously has uh, profound consequences that go beyond the material. Joy Davenport, I wanna ask you, one of the things that struck me about this film is that there is no omniscient voice of God narrator. The dominant voice in the film is Fannie Lou Hamer's itself, sometimes in isolation, sometimes in conjunction with other people. Why did you make that call? She is the voice of God. I mean, she is the voice that we need to hear. I, I feel like for a voice as powerful and unique and resonant as hers, it should be the only one telling us about her. I think that's both an ethical decision and a creative decision that leads to it having more power to get across what it is she was trying to get across. Because the film is structured like one of her speeches. Her speeches were one of the primary sources we had to go to to document her life. And we didn't want to have talking head historians or a voice of God narrator to get between us and her. We wanted to get as close as possible to her. And as you say, and I don't have the sonic knowledge to describe this, but, but simply on an audio level. There is so much contained in her voice and there's such a depth of feeling in there that it really creates, I think, a, a different sensation as you're watching it. Monica, uh, can you describe for me briefly what happened? And I say briefly, it's such a horrific event, sustained event, but it seems to me incredibly important in her life. What happened to Fannie Lou Hamer in Winona, Mississippi, and how did it shape her life moving forward? Well, they were returning from a voter registration workshop. Um, they stopped to use the restaurant, to use the restroom facilities. Um, and one of the often misconceptions that we hear 
is that Aunt Fannie Lou also went into the restaurant, and that is incorrect. She actually stayed on the bus. Which we hear and her so say in the film. And so when they went into this restaurant, exactly, exactly. Um, but it, it has been printed or uh, continued to be repeated that she was in the restaurant and she was not. And so um, it was a segregated um, um, facility. And so when she saw her colleagues rush out, she, of course, naturally stepped off to see what was the problem. And one of her colleagues told her to, to get back on the bus. And as she did that, of course, she was taken into custody. One of the law enforcement officials said, get that one there. And so they um, arrested her, put her in the car. She tells the story and she was arrested. And it was, uh, I'm positive that I can say, as it would be for anyone, particularly a 44, 45 year old woman to be beaten um, with such um, um, force, um, it, 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 it was traumatic. Um, it was an experience that she never forgot. It had long lasting emotional, mental and physical ramifications. And so, but she was able to use that. A great deal of her testimony um, at the Democratic National Convention was spent talking about that very experience. And I may note, um, I don't know if it add, uh, was added in the final cut or not, that you know there were, there were charges brought, there was a trial, but there was an all white jury and um, no one was held accountable for that situation. They beat several people, including a 15 year old girl um, and no one was uh, held accountable for it. And so something like that, you know, you think about today, the aggression we see with people with Black Lives Matter when police are found or acquitted because of a particular crime, the rage that it evokes from the public. Um, and Fannie Lou had to deal with that and she used it throughout her career. It's an almost, when you when you get into the details of it, I, it, I found myself wondering how she lived, I mean, how she was physically able to survive and then to move on from it, but she did move on. As you said, she bore witness in this incredibly powerful way in a number of settings. She ran for Congress. Uh, she was active in trying to shake up the Democratic Party, providing an alternative to the exist, existing racist structure. At the end or toward the end of her civil rights activism, there's a moment that's highlighted in the film that points to a bigger dynamic when Roy Wilkins, the very well-known civil rights leader, speaks to her dismissively, basically says, you're not what we're looking for in the movement anymore, and it's time for you to bow out. Joy Davenport, can you explain why someone like Roy Wilkins would have been so dismissive of Hamer? So this is something that continues today. This isn't unique to the historical moment, but there was a kind of respectability politics in play where she wasn't the face of the movement that they wanted to promote. They called her uneducated. They said that she didn't understand. She was ignorant of how things really were. And they wanted to get her out of the spotlight because the thing is, once she starts speaking, it's hard not to listen. And they, they found that she was getting attention that they wanted to be directing towards other things. And it was disruptive of the plans of the institutionalists like Roy Wilkins for her to come with her Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party and say, hold on now, none of this is right. Like we gotta just start from the ground floor if we're gonna get this right. And that's not how the institutionalists of the time were trying to promote the movement. So she was in many ways beset from all sides because the people who she was working with in some ways didn't support her and the people she was working against definitely did not support her. I should have mentioned at the outset that her speech at the DNC was so threatening to various people that, if I recall correctly, President Lyndon Baines Johnson preempted it, held a speech of his own to distract from this address that she was giving. Am I getting that right? Yeah, well, he kind of Streisand affected it Correct. because mm -hmm. uh, originally, the, yeah, she was giving her speech and people were watching it and he didn't like that. So he called a primetime address to announce like today's Thursday or whatever. And because of that, the other networks were like, well, we need to show the whole speech. And so it ended up getting more attention because he got spooked by her. Monica Land, we only have a few seconds left, but as her descendant, her relative, what do you think the lesson of Fannie Lou Hamer's life is for people today and, as you said, for activists today? Um, resilience. Um, you know, I, I, I love the fact that she was a common person. And I think that's what made her so effective and so popular. People often can't relate to someone that has, does not have shared experiences. And so because she came from, you know, um, the cotton field was a sharecropper, her life was a life of poverty. 
And so she could relate to people like no one else of that stature could. And so likewise today, I think people are looking for a voice that's familiar to their own, yeah. um, a circumstance. And so I think that's why her legacy continues to resonate. Um, every time it seems you see a Black Lives Matter protest or something, someone has a sign or a shirt that has one of her quotes. Um, mm -hmm. Nobody's free until everybody's free. I'm sick and tired of being I sick and tired. I was actually they amazed to it, watching and the that film. speaks to the relevance. I'm, I'm sorry I interrupted. I was going to say watching the film, I was amazed at how it's many okay. phrases were familiar that I didn't know came from her. So we have to leave it there. Mm -hmm. Monica Land and Joy Davenport, thank you both. It's a fascinating film. Thank you so much. Thank you.